So what kind of opportunities are we creating in our school environments for that practice? We need to ask ourselves questions like, who's reflected in our environment? If you only remember one question, this is the most important one. Who's missing from the picture? Who is missing from the picture? And what opportunities exist for building community? What opportunities exist for encouraging dialogue across difference? And how are we engaging students in that process so that they are developing the leadership skills they need for success in a diverse society? <coughs> I have one final example I want to share, which is really about the ABCs in action. This is a college example, but it doesn't have to be a college example. It could be something that happens in a high school setting, even a middle school setting. And that is the creation of dialogue groups. The particular example that I'm going to refer to is at the University of Michigan. And in October 2016, I visited the campus and had the opportunity to spend time with a program called the Michigan Community Scholars Program. It's a living, learning, residential community. So in this case, the students are living together. Um, but it has cross-group dialogue at its center. As part of the residential program, which is intentionally multiracial, breaking down that segregation, they are very intentional in creating a very diverse living community. The students, both white and of color, who live there, talk to me about what they have gained from the experience and also about how different their experience was from that of their classmates who are not part of the program. They are deeply engaged in learning how to talk about difficult topics with each other rather than past each other or avoiding the conversations altogether. In, the, in 2016, and sadly this is being repeated this fall at the University of Michigan, white supremacist posters with explicitly anti-black content have appeared around the university's campus, creating a hostile environment for black students who feel under attack. One young black woman in, in her first year at the University of Michigan told me that, this is a quote from her, she said, it's hard to focus on your schoolwork when there's so much hateful stuff. It's hard to know who to trust. It takes energy to reach out to whites without knowing if they are safe. The Michigan Community Scholars Program helps with that because she's able to engage in dialogue with her white peers and get to know them in a way that makes her feel like they're trustworthy. A white woman in her cohort was quick to second that observation, even though as a white student she was not the target of hateful rhetoric. She said, MCSP is the only place where I've felt constantly supported, listened to, and understood. When we get it right, it makes a difference. Research shows that when schools and communities are truly integrated with real opportunities for students of different racial backgrounds to take the same classes, participate in clubs and sports together, collaborate on projects, they make more friends across racial lines and express more positive views than other students do. As adults, longitudinal studies show that they are more likely to live and work in diverse settings, more likely to be civically engaged, more likely to vote, less fearful of race-related interactions. And in my view, that's what better looks like. So is it better? Not yet, but it could be. And it's up to us to make sure that it is. Thank you very much. talk show and run around with the mic. Um, but I, I think as a first question, we're going to go with, um, as a psychologist as you are, and as this is mostly pretty much a room of educators, pre-K, 16, graduate, um, educators, and community activists, how do we engage kids and young people in this conversation? 
I don't think that's hard. So let me just say, what I mean by that is, in my experience, young people have questions and they want to talk about these issues. And my experience is that more often, young people, even preschoolers, ask questions, raise issues, and it's the adults that shut down the conversation. So, so the key really is, I mean, of course the answer is going to vary depending on the appropriateness, you know, age appropriate, you know, we have to be age appropriate. But for example, let's use a preschool example. Preschool children notice difference. They talk about difference, they ask questions. They might hear things on the news and ask questions. And so are we as adults prepared to respond in an age appropriate way to those questions? Certainly in my book, there's a chapter on how to talk to young children about race. I want to make a plug for a TEDx talk I recorded in the spring, uh, which you can find on YouTube. It, the title of it is, Is My Skin Brown Because I Drank Chocolate Milk? And, um, and it's based on a conversation with a three-year-old about skin color differences. But often, we find that you know, young people will ask questions, and if an adult is uncomfortable, with the conversation, they will quickly, shh them in a way, you know, either overtly or covertly, to limit the conversation. You know, we don't have time to talk about that now. Let's move on to some other topic. I mean, there are lots of ways we do it. So the fact that the matter is, if we want to encourage that kind of conversation, we can certainly take the cues that are coming to us from young people as a way of starting the conversation. But we can also, particularly with older children, build in curricular prompts, you know, whether that's history lessons or, you know, civic government discussions, you know, just the, you know, daily news gives you something to talk about, right? So, um, so I would just say we need to think about, as adults, we need to think about what our own anxieties are about the conversation. And if we work through those anxieties, we'll be much better positioned to help young people with their understandings. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? You have a hand back here. Way back here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Drawing a circle of inclusion sort of presupposes that all of the individuals that you're drawing the circle around want to be included. It also presupposes that all of the people who you're drawing the circle around aren't being influenced by members outside of the circle. So while I agree that having a conversation with children is somewhat easier, they go home to families where there's a different conversation in some instances. So my question for you is this. How do you draw a circle of inclusion such that individuals who don't want to be included or who in fact fear the inclusion will in some way see the benefit such that they'll at least engage in the conversation? Thank you for your question, and it is certainly the case as we know, that you know, children spend a certain amount of time in school, but then of course they're at home and they're being exposed to attitudes of the adults in their home environment or other places. And those attitudes may not align with the messages that they're getting at school. I you know, have had the opportunity to talk a lot with school leaders, heads of school, principals, um, college and university presidents. And one of the things that often talk about is the way in which you can rely upon the core values of the institution, the um, mission of the institution, you know, depending on the, you know, whether you're a public or private or independent school will vary, but every school has certain statements about what the school is trying to accomplish, right? You know, what the goal of the school is, whether it's, you know, educating leaders or creating a pathway to success in the future, whatever, you know, the language varies. But to the extent that you can link your efforts on around equity and inclusion to the goal of the system, the educational system, you can say, we must do that. You know, if we are preparing young children for the future, 
then we must help them learn how to engage with people different from themselves. Now, if you don't want that to happen, there's always homeschooling, right? But if you are um, part of this community, this community values dealing with people with respect and uh, acceptance and whatever the language is. I, some of you, I'm sure, have seen that statement by um, the Lieutenant General at the Air Force Academy, did you see that on the news, uh, after they had a racial incident, and he brought everybody together and he said, you know, I have a better idea. You know, this racist behavior is a bad idea, I have a better idea. And the better idea is that we've got a community where everybody's treated with respect and dignity, and if you can't get on board with that, then you need to get out. And I forwarded that to a colleague, college president, who was struggling with some campuses, uh, some campus issues, and I just thought it was a really clear example of strong leadership. And of course, you know, in the military, you can say, you get out, right? And so we don't always have the same freedom uh, or authority, you know, as someone in a hierarchical system like the military. But that said, we can all be crystal clear about what our values and expectations are. We might not be able to say, and don't come back here ever again, but um, but we can say, this is our community, these are what our values are, we are going to live by these values. And young people creating the kind of community you want to create, even though there are some people who may never completely agree with that point of view, their influence is weakened in ways that I think are ultimately healthy for children and for the school. But I appreciate asking your, asking your question. I want to say something else about that. Because sometimes, you did this was not implied in your question, but it made me think of another version of it, which is those of you who are working with the adults in the system. You know, we talk a lot about kids, but then there are the faculty, the staff, the administrators. And not everybody is on the same level of understanding or the same plane in terms of these issues. And sometimes people say, gosh, you know, you're talking to this audience here. We are the choir, you know, but we're pitching to the choir. What about all the people who aren't here this morning who should be here or need to hear this? And I like to say, well, of course, we would like as many people as possible to think about these issues. If you are part of the choir, what I want to say to you is the choir needs rehearsal. I know. <laughs> choir is well rehearsed, it sounds good when it sings, right? And so when you are well rehearsed, you are going to be able to do the work so effectively that other people will say, as they do when they hear a great choir, I wish I could sing like that. I wish I could, you know, be part of that group. And that's what you really want to have happen. So don't despair. Just practice your singing, um, and you will inspire other people. I mean, it's amazing to me, over the course of my, you know, now 40 years almost, uh, doing this work, that, um, you know, even when I wasn't doing it that well, people will say, you know, I was inspired by something you said. I was moved to, you know, do something because of that conversation we had. You never know who you're influencing. So don't assume that you're not. Question? Oh, do you have one? Anyone else? I see a hand over here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, my question is related to how the adults shut down the conversation. So I have a question about the political atmosphere in our country. As a teacher, it's difficult to know when you're dialoguing, what it is you can say as far as the political atmosphere, because much of what is going on is stemming from that. Yes. Well, this is why I think it's really important to recognize the power of each of our own leadership, right? You know, I've been doing a lot of interviews talking about my book, which just came out a month ago, and so I've been doing, you know, a sort of little book tour, and, um, I get asked a lot about the current administration. And, you know, while of course I have opinions about the current administration, what I really want to focus on is what 
each person listening to the sound of my voice on the radio, wherever I'm talking, can do. Because if we, you know, the truth of the matter is, I'm not going to change Donald Trump's personality. I'm just not, right? <laughs> you know? Um, and he's going to continue to do and say the things he does and says. But that, he's not the only source of influence, right? He's not the only source of, and of course he's got, and people like him and people who are aligned with him um, in his administration, I think of, you know, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, for example. You know, they have the power to impact things in a really, in my opinion, negative way. That said, each one of us is influencing someone every moment. And so if you think about what's your sphere of influence, who do you influence in your classroom, in your school, at home, in your neighborhood, in your place of worship? You know, if you think about your own sphere of influence and how you use it. Um, now, I appreciate what you just said. You know, you're a, you know, so you're a classroom teacher. You can't necessarily, um, it, it may be difficult for you to stand up and express, and perhaps inappropriate to express, your political opinions about anybody in particular. That said, you can help young people think critically about what they're reading in the news. You can give them a historical context. Um, that what you know, there's nothing new under the sun, as they say. What we are seeing today is not unlike what was happening during the after post Reconstruction. Right? You know, there are one of the best articles I read after the election that helped to cheer me up a little bit was an article that appeared in the Washington Post and it was titled something like, In the Age of Trump, What Would the Abolitionists Do? And it was about the experience of abolitionists after they lost an important vote and how they then mobilized to keep at the, their cause of abolition and, you know, to keep going and, you know, how they used the penny printing press, which was, you know, the 19th century version of Twitter and, you know, all of, you know, to kind of go door to door to really convey their message. And so I think there are ways to talk about what's happening now um, and put it in a historical context and, you know, get young people thinking about, you know, what, a hundred years ago, what would you have been doing? You know, how does that connect to what you see happening now, as an example? I want to lift up an organization called Facing History in Ourselves, which maybe you're familiar with. But if you're not, they have great resources, curricular resources for teachers to use in classrooms. And I think that's a good place to start. I think maybe we have time for one more. One more. No. Oh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have a syndrome here in Minnesota known as Minnesota Nice, uh, which I like to describe as uh, the best way to know how it really is is to put parentheses around the end, because sometimes it's not so nice, it's more ice. Uh, but that means that there's a lot of passive aggression. And things like uh, people saying, oh, I'm colorblind. And can't, uh, can't we all just get along? And so they're quietly obstructionists, but they don't do anything overt. And as a result, a lot of times it's hard to get leadership to recognize and address the problem. So how do we make people do it? Well, it's, um, so let me just say, you know, I have heard of Minnesota Nice, and, um, you know, and I can, I've also heard of Southern Hospitality, and, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, California Cool, and, you know, I mean, that this is not unique to Minnesota, in the sense that there are many people who are um, wanting to be pleasant, but not wanting to engage with the underlying systemic nature of racism in our society and the ways in which it's playing itself out in schools and other places. And it is sometimes hard to get people to have that conversation because it makes people uncomfortable. There's no question about that. Um, one of the reasons I'm so delighted that so many of you have read the earlier version of my book, certainly I make this point again in this version, 
you know, it's hard for people to talk about race because it does generate discomfort, it generates anxiety, and we can understand that. But I also want to say that we use up a lot of energy, you know, that um, we use up a lot of... If there were a big elephant on this stage, and I asked you to look at the elephant and now put it out of your mind, <laughs> you'd have to work really hard at that. Right, especially if that elephant was lumbering around, knocking over things, or you know, um, you'd be. Or let me use another analogy that just came to my mind. Let's say if I said there's a snake up here, and then I'm letting the snake loose, and it's going to be slithering around. But don't worry, don't think about it. <laughs> you know, you might find it hard to focus on anything other than where is that snake, and is it anywhere near me? You know, but but I would. If I really urge you, please don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it. You might be able to distract yourself, but it would take a lot of psychological energy. And one of the things that is so striking to me, over the course of my career, when I have worked with teachers around doing anti-racist pedagogy in schools and having conversation in schools, when they really get into it, one of the things they say without question, without exception, is how energizing it was. And why is that? Because we use a lot of energy not talking about it. And once you give people permission to have those conversations and get past the initial discomfort, then it starts to feel like, wow, what a relief. You know, it starts to feel like a good thing. But here's the problem. Most schools don't do it in a way that allows people to ever get to that place. So many uh, school environments do professional development like one workshop and then we're done, right? All that does is give you enough to get uncomfortable. Never enough to get to the good place of feeling like we are actually making progress. And I sometimes use the analogy of an antibiotic. You know, I can tell you that this will work for you, but it's only going to work if you take the whole dose. Right? You have to take the whole dose. If you just take the little bit, your ear might stop hurting, but guess what? Two weeks from now, you're going to have another earache and it's going to be worse. And that's, if we think about our conversations about racism in our schools as being like that, we do enough to like relieve a little bit of the pressure, but not enough to really get to a sense of moving forward. Take the whole dose. Um, and really invest the time and energy you need to have tough conversations and then move beyond them. To